<laughs> For science. Hi, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, and this is Rising Stars. Today, we're talking with the creators of ASAP Science, one of the most innovative YouTube channels all about science. Mitch Moffat and Greg Brown, and they're here right now. Greg, Mitch. Hi. Okay. <laughs> so what, uh, what, what were you thinking? <laughs> so I went and talked in the UK in this small mining town. If I put on like just the YouTube page, and it was the only time they would like stop throwing things at me. And like, oh. and it was literally just the YouTube. I wouldn't even have to put a video on. They'd all be like, oh, what's gonna happen? And Stare then, at the blank YouTube screen <laughs> yeah. in anticipation Yeah, or of they something. would watch this, you know, maybe long drawn out science, you know, video and they would, in silence. And so I think that what we started to realize was, in fact, we could do something like this. So what are some of your most popular posted videos? Okay, well our most popular one to still to date, I think, is the one about the dress, whether it was black or blue. Okay. We have one on the microbiomes. What, how much sleep do I need? Or like, why do I get hung over, right? Is masturbation good for you? Is still growing very quickly. Uh -huh. So there's other- It's still swelling. Right? Yeah. Oh <laughs> my God. That was good. It's still swelling. <laughs> no one liked my answer about the dress. What was no, your answer? answer? No, my answer was, your brain is an awful data taking device. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. That's why we have science. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, so do you have a panel of like, professional scientists reviewing no, we don't. We actually, we use science information, we use journals, we use okay. peer-reviewed studies, and we think about how we can take the studies and the language to explain it in the best way that we can. And what we've done now, and it, we've essentially, is we've hired writers who are just women. And we've only how hired we, women. Yeah. I think that's, I don't know if it's like a gay thing as gay men, but we're like, these women are <laughs> just who we want to hire. Our channel was highly male-centric in the mm -hmm. ideas that we thought about. Right. And that is very true. We, and it was ingrained harder. in us. Even though we were gay men, everything was like coming at it with this specific bias because we were writing it. So oh, in a way, you are science journalists. That's what you're doing. Your medium just isn't the printed word. Yeah. yeah. That's really interesting because it was almost even today that we were talking about this, like making that connection. Because sometimes what will happen is we'll make this video and then like I read the New Yorker every week and sometimes I'll just read their science thing and be like, wait, we did that video and the information's quite similar. Yeah. And I think we we like to say that we're science communicators is what we're trying to do. Um, so what's, uh, do you have a goal? I think the overarching goal has always been just to pique people's curiosity. In particular, like we love that we have fans that already love science, but mm -hmm. it's like, how do you find the people who aren't intersecting with science in the first place? I'm just thinking about something. If you guys, continue to be successful, it could transform education in the schools. We are not replacing teachers. I mean, we have three minute videos. A teacher has to spend at least an hour to an hour and a half with one topic um, and engaging students for that long is obviously much more difficult than once a week for three minutes engaging someone. So I, I do think there is a place for us to supplement teachers and engage mm -hmm. kids and get them fascinated with a topic and then dive into more. Right. But I definitely do think that, I mean, Greg can probably speak to this more because you were a teacher, but. Classrooms are obviously transforming with technology and with the interests of kids and trying to figure out, okay, how do we break out of the, the format and the structure that schools have had for so long that mm -hmm. obviously in many cases do not work right. and don't cater to like different styles of learning either. Students being able to grasp onto what they're interested in first instead of trying to force them to be interested in something is so powerful and education is shifting towards that. How long it's gonna to take to really get there is a big question, and I think that we're just hopeful that we can be a part of that process. So, so you guys um, efficiently communicate a lot of information in a way that's very pleasing to the eye and to the ear. If you go to classical education, well, right. slow down, yeah, yeah, first yeah, learn yeah, this, and let's yeah. pause. And yeah. <laughs> in the modern era, no. Yeah, no, no, that's very interesting. And we actually have a lot of our parents' friends who continually email us and will be like, slow down. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like, really bad. Really over 50? Like, Girl, I think you're just old. <laughs> yeah. I feel really bad, but the, it's a thread. <laughs> We're like, everyone else is keeping up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, but, yeah. By the way, that fact goes way back. If you look at people writing about the future of computing and the internet back in the 70s and 80s, uh, they were worried that there'd be like so much information our brains would melt, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and today, anyone like over 60, they're saying, no, there's too much information, it's moving too fast. I said, ask anyone under 30 that same <laughs> question. And I asked, my, my kids are like 15, 20. I say, is there too much information out there? And they say, Dad, I don't even understand your question. <laughs> what? Why is that even a question? Yeah. <laughs> is it coming at you too fast? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, so the, they're true. born into it. It's a yeah. new broad rate for the brain. 
So you guys are thriving in a medium that was only recently invented. Is there some future that you look forward to? Like what, when we're older, what we're looking back and going, wow, like that, is that what you mean? Because <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think about that all the time. Is it like time. living forever? Right. Or? That's what you want to do. I, I love the idea of living forever. I, I often That's ask That's very selfish of you, by the way. I know, I, like, I, want, I want everyone to live forever, like with me. With you, okay. <laughs> yeah. That but means I, no one new will be born. Unless you, unless, unless you we move, move. Oh, unless, yeah, unless you colonize other planets. Yeah, yeah. we got to get there spread. as well. Yeah, I like. Oh, like, yeah. yeah, you want to colonize a couple <laughs> of things. <laughs> First, colonize other planets. Then I can live forever. <laughs> right. And another thing that we've researched about is a stuff called utility fog. Have you heard of this? No. It's a. Con it's very much a concept. It's like tons of micro technologies that communicate with each it's other. It's modular. So this modular. chair could be made of this utility fog. It assembles and makes a chair and then as we leave, it can disassemble and move away and become something else. Well, I see, because most of the time, you're not using things, things for why they were designed. Exactly, and like for space and for overpopulation, I think the theory is that you could have living modular headquarters and places that would disappear when the function of them is not necessary because there's gonna be less space. But the idea that we somehow can control the environment and have it serve our needs in that moment. Yeah, we, and it learns. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? But also, I was thinking about the other day about how whenever you would watch a sci-fi movie from the past and they would think of the future and driving, they would always have someone in like a hovercraft driving, being like, mm, like, look at this new car. Right, right. But now, as they're getting with driverless cars and thinking of how it's all gonna maybe be an algorithm, sorting each other out, I was like, it is so interesting that in the past, they couldn't have the foresight to make the sci-fi movie where, no, in fact, no one's driving. Now, we all love science fiction movies. Is the one that has the kind of future you want, or is the one in particular that you know you don't want? Children of Men. Have you seen Children of Men? Yes, I have. Yeah. Oh, that's, just, that's, that's disturbing. Movie. Yes. Disturbing oh, movie. Disturbing movie. Oh my gosh. Fascinating movie, but that's one I don't want. Okay. And that's when people are, are no longer able to reproduce. <laughs> that was the same director as the movie Gravity? That's Gravity. Yes. Yeah, yeah, Alfonso Cuaron. Yeah, Alfonso Cuaron. One of my Alfonso favorite Poiron. directors, yeah. Yeah. Did you like Gravity? Yes, I did. People yeah. thought I hated it because I, I said some stuff it. they could have done a little, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. they, they overlooked some yeah. physics. <laughs> But no, I thought it was brilliant. I think when it comes to science fiction movies where it's a world that I want is more rare. Yeah. Could it be? Uh, Ray Bradbury's famous comment when they said, uh, why are you showing us these futures that are so disturbing? Yeah. Is this what you think the future is? He says, no. No, I, I think that there's a lot of science fiction movies, you're right, are rooted in a lot of fear. And there can be a lot of good from that. Especially when maybe it's something to do with like climate change right. or like talking about natural disasters and right. things like that. Because or artificial I do... intelligence. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like... Uh, both of you have strong biology backgrounds, right? And so you might be better equipped to think creatively about what alien life might look like. Right. <laughs> Have you thought much about that? Yeah. What are they likely to be made of? Right. What's successful on Earth? What would might likely be successful in terms of bio functions mm -hmm. on another planet? Have you thought much about that? Yeah, I think it's obviously much more complicated to understand like what is alien life in the first place? And we intrinsically jump to this idea that they look like us, that they have the Well, because an actor is in the rubber suit. Exactly, That's like they've got a fit yeah, human yeah. in the sci-fi movie. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that it's, it's so complicated to think about, like if you think about that utility fog, maybe it's more of a life form that's not like mobile. At all. Yeah, exactly. At like, all, That right. doesn't function in a way that we can really predict. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a question for you. Yeah. Because I've always thought about this. Could aliens also be made of substances that we wouldn't be able to see visually? It's not likely. Not likely. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Because I'm a scientist and I have dozens of senses. <laughs> because we have methods and tools that measure things in your environment that your human physiology has no clue is there. From multispectral imaging to gravitational fields to ionizing radiation to polarization. And so to say there's a thing we will not detect, maybe, yeah. But we detect so, so much, much that okay. you already don't see. I see what you mean. So if aliens come, we'll see them. <laughs> in some way. <laughs> we'll, we'll find some way to, to know, to, so we know who to punch in the face, yeah. where, 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 where they are. All right, well you may actually be a force in enabling that future. 
based on your influence of those who are touched by your Thank videos. Thank you so much. That's our hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right.